Hello, and welcome to a video series on COVID and guns brought to you by the Duke Center for Firearms Law and the Duke School of Law at Duke University. In this series, we talk to experts on firearms law and policy about the role of guns in the ongoing pandemic. My name is Daryl Miller. I'm the Melvin G. Shim Professor of Law at Duke University and a co-faculty director at the Center for Firearms Law. And today, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Jennifer Carlson, who's the Associate Professor of Sociology, Government, and Public Policy at the University of Arizona, and an expert on guns, criminal justice law, politics, and gender. She's the author of Citizen Protectors, Everyday Politics of Law and Guns in the Age of Decline, and the forthcoming Policing the Second Amendment, Guns, Law Enforcement, and the Politics of Race. Thank you so much for having me. Now, first off, can you tell us about your approach to studying firearms? Sure. So I am a sociologist, uh, which means that I am interested in society. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in social structure. And I think in some ways, despite the fact that sociologists um, generally have not spent a lot of time studying guns in America, even though that's changing, uh, in some ways, the, the history and the legal um, story of, of how, what guns mean in the United States, how they matter, how they've been regulated, is such a self-evident uh, sociological story. So the debates we have about what does the Second Amendment really mean, what do people do with the guns they own, how that changes over time, all of those things are deeply sociological questions that recognize that it's not just about sort of the letter of the law, or um, you know the the mechanics of a gun, but actually, in fact, uh, the meanings that people attach to guns, the uses that they, the ways that they make use of guns, um, in terms of personal protection, hunting, sports shooting, that all of these things are huge in terms of understanding the social life of guns and how guns, um, yeah, what 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 the significance of guns are um, to Americans and in, in American society. Uh, so I, um, yeah, I I. I think a lot about not just uh, gun law and guns themselves, but the meanings um, and the practices by which guns come to matter to the people who own and carry them. Now, there's been reporting about an increase in gun sales, uh, motivated at least in part by the current pandemic and fears of COVID. Uh, do you have thoughts about what might be driving people to uh, be purchasing guns more at this time? Yeah, so I've actually been interviewing gun sellers I have been uh, talking to gun sellers. Uh, this is, you know, the research is still obviously ongoing, uh, but I've been talking to gun sellers in California and Florida. I'm gonna be moving to talk to gun sellers in Michigan and Arizona as well. So I'm trying to get sort of a, a broad understanding in terms of region, in terms of different gun cultures, in terms of different gun laws, what is going on in terms of in terms of the surge? And we've you know we've all seen the numbers from the the background checks that have been conducted since the um, since coronavirus was declared a pandemic, and it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty massive. It's pretty striking um, in terms of what the the surge looks like. And so I am definitely hearing from gun sellers confirmation of what we've seen a lot in the headlines, which is that these are first time gun owners. They are are coming into, you know, some of them are very uh, clearly coming into gun stores saying, I've never owned a gun before, I've been in favor of gun control, but now I feel like I need a gun. Uh, so some of this, and this is based, of course, on what gun sellers that I've talked to have been hearing, uh, some of this is, you know, very much, um, you know, I'm worried that my local police department, that they're, they're going to get sick, and so I'm not going to be able to rely on them. I'm worried about crimes of opportunity as people get desperate, you know, toilet paper's out, and so it's seems like having a gun might be a good idea at this moment. Um, but then there's also sort of, so there's sort of the, the concrete concerns about, um, you know, becoming a victim of crime and not having the police there to assist you if you, if you do become a victim. And then there's sort of these broader um, concerns about uh, social breakdown, social collapse, uh, civil unrest, uh, martial law, government overreach. And what I find, what I'm finding really interesting is um, that actually uh, it's, it's already, even at this preliminary stage, pretty striking how different gun sellers in California versus Florida are talking about this. So everybody is seeing the rise in first time gun owners. Everybody's seeing sort of this, this concern um, among gun buyers about crime and about, you know, that, that, that crime could go up and, and things are uncertain and there's a lot of fear. Um, but it's actually in Florida that I'm hearing a lot more about these sort of 
broader uh, concerns about civil unrest and that sort of thing. Um, and what's interesting is you can actually see this um, according to, you know, uh, the, the data that the gun sellers have given me in terms of what guns are being sold. So in um, California, it's, it's almost exclusively uh, shotguns, handguns, which of course are generally designated as the, the home, home defense weapons, uh, quote unquote. Um, and what I'm hearing in, in Florida is that there's actually, you know, not as much as the handguns and the, the shotguns, but that AR-15s are actually going, um, that they're picking up steam too. So it's really interesting actually from, again, like a data perspective, a sociological perspective, that you can actually trace out, um, you know, you can, you can um, actually see uh, differences in motivation, obviously by just the, the, you know, sheer kind of gun and how many of those guns are being, are being sold. Um, so that's something that I, I'm finding really interesting. And of course, when I get to Michigan and Arizona, I'm sure it's going to be another twist on sort of, um, you know, that, that story. Uh, I think related to your last comments, uh, my recollection is that for your citizen protectors book uh, that you had done some uh, extensive field research in Michigan and Michigan seems to have become kind of a hot spot for protest related to COVID uh, and uh, the coronavirus and especially in the lockdowns. I think today uh, there was supposed to be a um, uh, a, a protest by um, uh, by uh, citizens with guns uh, that led to the shutdown of uh, the Michigan legislature for the day. Um, so in your experience, what, what do you think uh, and why do you think this is happening in, in Michigan and how, how do you think uh, or anticipate the, the Michigan dynamic to be different than the ones that you just discussed with, with California and Florida? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Michigan is an absolutely fascinating state politically. You know, this is a state that gave us labor unions. Uh, it has historically been a blue state, but it has been turning purple. Obviously, it went to Trump in the last uh, presidential election cycle. It is a very active state in terms of gun politics, um, you know, concealed carry, the open carry movement. Um, and there are, uh, you know, leading up to this, uh, there have been, I've attended um, our marches on Lansing. Um, that's something that has happened actually for quite a while in Michigan. So, you know, while the rest of the U.S. is looking at this and saying, oh my goodness, people are congregating um, in Lansing with their guns, in fact, this happens um, and has happened for years, uh, you know, in libraries, in police stations, in, you know, in front of and inside, um, you know, the, the offices of the state lawmakers. So this is actually something that isn't, um, it, it's in the repertoire of politics within Michigan, even though, you know, obviously looking from the outside, this seems very uh, jolting. If you live, say, in California or in Arizona, we don't see this. We see it some, but but not to the extent that I at least um, saw when I was doing research there in 2010. So I think there's that element um, for sure going on. Um, and I think that there's also the, the broader political, um, you know, kind of tensions with the, um, you know, with Michigan kind of being this this um, space where you know it's it's a purple state. It's uh, there are very strong conservative elements. Uh, you have the Michigan militia. Uh, you also have um, you know very strong liberal. Uh, you have liberal strongholds in the state as well. Uh, so I think what that adds up to is um, sort of a very um, well. And then you have of course, and I think you know this is maybe anecdotal to say this, but I think there's also something about sort of the work ethic. This like very like labor organizing sort of um, you know ethic in in Michigan and. I I often think that that's why um, you know people are so organized uh, across actually a lot of very divergent political projects. Uh, so yeah, so I think um, you know definitely from um, the perspective of my research, where I attended a lot of open carry picnics, um, open carry marches, I saw this. This was not something unusual that was happening in Michigan. I'm not at all surprised to see that this is uh, that that would be a form that these politics would take. So I understand that um, you are a licensed firearm instructor, uh, and um, there's lots of people obviously with guns at home right now, uh, as well as uh, taking guns uh, to some of these public protests. Um, uh, in your experience as a, 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 at one time a licensed firearm instructor, uh, what guidance would you offer at this, at this point? 
Sure. Yeah. So I should I should clarify that um, I did become an NRA certified instructor as part of my research for my first book, Citizen Protectors. I never joined the NRA. I did not license anyone to carry a gun and that licensing has since expired. So I just want to be super clear <laughs> where I'm speaking from. But if you want to read my book, you can see um, sort of why I thought it was so important to actually understand uh, how gun training figured into gun politics and gun culture. Uh, but speaking from that perspective, uh, I definitely have uh, two thoughts on how to think about gun safety, especially for first time gun owners who um, are not comfortable or not, um, you know, not super comfortable with uh, with handling guns. Uh, the first would be really take seriously the four rules of gun safety. So treat all guns as if they are always loaded, never point the muzzle at anything you aren't willing to shoot and destroy. Do not put your finger on the trigger until you are actually ready to shoot and be sure of not just your target, and this is obviously, you know, wherever you would be pointing that gun, not just that target, but also what lies beyond it. So that's number one. Number two has to do with safe storage. Uh, so, you know, a lot of us are at home, a lot of us are dealing with, um, you know, kids are at home, family members are at home working. Um, this is a stressful situation, no matter how you cut it with regard to people, um, people dealing with the various uh, ramifications of this pandemic and responses to it. Uh, you absolutely, as a gun owner, um, must be, must take as your, uh, as a huge responsibility, preventing unauthorized access to that firearm. And so, you know, when we're thinking about the risk of suicide, gun accidents and negligence, um, having a safe or some kind, and usually it's a safe, um, some kind of secure locking device for that gun um, is absolutely crucial. And I know that's disappointing to hear that you just spent all this money on a gun and on the ammo and now a safe, you know, a good safe is not inexpensive, but um, having a safe, I, I think is, is one of the crucial things to, to do if you are going to be a responsible, a responsible gun owner. Uh, well, I really appreciate the time and uh, you doing this for us, Jenny. Um, and uh, I hope you are well and keeping well there in Arizona. We really appreciate the chance for you to uh, uh, share your expertise and talk to us about this really uh, pertinent issue on everybody's mind. So um, thanks to all of you out there uh, for joining us in this discussion, and please send any questions or suggestions or thoughts or comments to us via email at firearmslaw@law.duke.edu. Or you can check us out online at law.duke.edu slash firearms. You can follow us at Twitter at Duke Firearms Law. Or you can subscribe to our blog, Second Thoughts, which you can find on the center's webpage. Thank you.